This is a video that continues the lesson on random variables, and it looks at a really specific kind called binomials. Binomials determine the likelihood of getting k successes in n trials. So this could be something like, what's the likelihood that I get heads 10 times if I flip a coin 25 times? Or much more complicated things like, what's the likelihood that there are at least 20 people that are O negative out of 200 people sampled? Um, so let's just start out with the situation here where we're looking at successes in some number of trials involving candies in a jar. So there are 500 candies in a jar, 40 of those are blue. If you draw two candies in a row, what's uh, replacing and mixing them between pulls? So I take a candy, I pull it out, I put it back in and I mix it up. What's the probability that I draw two blue in a row? If you do not replace the candy between pulls, what is the probability of drawing two blues. Okay, so in this first situation, if we put the candy back in, then we're looking at the independent scenario. Probability of a blue on the first and a blue on the second should be the same probability because the container is not changing in between poles. I'm putting it back in and I'm stirring it up. So there's a 40 out of 500 chance for that first candy, but putting it back in, it remains 40 out of 500 for the second candy. Now I'm primarily just concerned about the setup here, but I'm still gonna figure out what the number is. I'm taking this probability, I'm multiplying it by itself, and I get 0.064. Let's consider now the dependent scenario. This is where I eat the candy between poles. So I get a blue on the first, and then I consume the blue. There's one less blue to get for the second. So it starts out as the 40 out of 500, but if I remove that candy, I only have 39 blue left, I used to have 500, I've taken one away, so I have 499 left. I'm gonna type this into a calculator and I'll see what I get. And when I do this, I get, oh, point zero zero six three. In this last number I'm seeing, I need one more zero, let's fix that. 0.0064. So comparing these two numbers, they're remarkably close, all things considered. And this might come as a surprise, but if you think about the number of candies, one candy out of 500 would be really hard to notice. So just as a general observation, if we sample few enough times, we can assume independence. And if I'm looking at these two situations and I'm trying to figure out what one's gonna have the easier math, well, if I just have the same number showing up twice, it's considerably easier to deal with situations that are independent than dependent. And usually I want small samples, so this is a little bit different. This is one of the few times uh, when I don't want this massive thing, I want something that I can contain. So independence, this is called the 10% rule. If we sample less than 10% of the population, we can assume within reason, independence. So this is a really desirable thing to have. So large samples are more representative of the population, but small samples, we can assume that two things don't interact with each other. So usually when we're collecting samples, we're trying to find the sweet spot between the two or sample in such a way where one thing doesn't affect each other. So for example, if we sampled 10 times from a population of 8 billion, 
you would not notice 10 like grains of sand missing on a beach out of 8 billion. So in a situation like this, 10 is less than 10% of 8 billion. And we could assume independence in that situation. Sampling 40 times without replacement from a population of 200, can we assume independence here? Well, 10% of 200 is 20. So if I'm sampling less than 20, I can assume that I have independence. If I'm sampling 20 or more, I cannot assume independence. So since 40 is bigger than 10% of 200, we cannot assume independence. So if I wanted to be doing any sort of math with example three and actually finding the probability of say 40 blue things in a row, I would have to have these changing probabilities that I keep track of using a giant tree. So given the option between the two, I would much rather prefer dealing with this kind of a situation today while we're looking at binomials. So since we have more than 10%, we cannot assume independence. Okay, I'm going to, before trying to look at say 40 successes out of 200 trials or anything like that, I wanna just consider one success out of one trial. So this will be the building block for what we're doing today. And it's something called a Bernoulli trial. So suppose I flip a fair coin once. I can either have one success or zero successes. So let X represent the number of heads, okay? So I'm making a very small table here. I can either have zero heads or I can have one head if I'm looking at a single coin flip. The probability of getting heads is 50%. The probability of getting tails, also 50%. Or heads and heads complement. If you're like, well, what if it lands on its side? Fine, heads and heads complement. The probability of getting a success, we're gonna use the letter P for that. The probability of failure, we're gonna use the letter Q for that. Calculate the expected value and variance in the previous problem. Okay, so I'm wondering what would my expected success rate look like? An expected value, which is the average. We take the first X value times the probability, the second X value times the probability, and then we add them up. I only have two values, so this is just gonna be these two things here. Zero times 0.5, one times 0.5, that's zero, that's 0.5. I have an average of 0.5. And the variance. Variance is sigma squared. I'm taking my value minus the center squared times the probability. Next value minus the center squared times the probability. Normally this is plus dot, dot, dot for all of the different X values, but I only have two options, either zero or one. First X value is zero. The average is 0 0.5 squared. The probability of zero is 0 0.5. Next value, one minus 0 0.5 is the average squared and the probability of one is 0 0.5. I'm going to type this into a calculator and see what I get. And it looks like I get 0 0.25. So what I'm doing here is I'm calculating the expected value and the variance to try to really understand what a single coin flip looks like. Because then I can use my shortcuts from the last page of uh, the previous lesson on random variables and use this to figure out what's going on for multiple coin flips. 
So this sort of building block of everything we're looking at is called a Bernoulli trial. And you can think of this as having only n equals one trial that we're looking at. Characteristics, there's a fixed probability of success, P for success, and a fixed probability of failure, Q. Just a note, P and Q are opposites or complements, so P plus Q is 100%. Q is the same thing as one minus P. There are only two options. So you either have X equals zero, a failure, or X equals one, a success. And this is just something you're counting. So it could be like purple candies or not purple candies. Uh, employed, not employed. Uh, healthcare does not have healthcare. Anything that I can have on a binary system. And the last option here is independence. And we now have a backup for this. So either independence or I'm sampling less than 10% of the population. So this is my building block. I'm calling this sort of my X for Bernoulli trial here. And we're gonna do a few more where we're just calculating the expected value and the variance to try to look for any sort of pattern that we can have for this building. So suppose I have P is 0.4, calculate the probability that X equals zero and X equals one. Okay, I'll make a little table. Sometimes you'll see me making these tables horizontally, sometimes you'll see me making them vertically. Either way is fine, whatever you're more comfortable with. P is my probability of success, so there is a 40% success rate. And if there's a 40% success rate, then there's a 60% failure rate. Probability of success is P. Probability of failure, Q. Finding that expected value, I'm taking the first X value in the table, zero, multiplied by the probability of zero, 0 0.6. Next X value in the table is one. The probability for one is 0 0.40. I type this into a calculator. I get, I'm expecting 0 0.4 successes. So it looks like it's just kind of spitting back the probability. And that kind of makes sense. So if I flip a coin, I'm expecting heads half the time. That's kind of what this is telling me. Variance, I've got the first value in the table, zero, minus the average, 0 0.4, squared times the probability of zero, 0 0.6. I've got the next value in the table, one, minus the center, 0 0.4, squared times the probability of one, 0 0.4. I'm going to type this in the calculator as well, and I'll see what I get. Great. 0 0.24. If you're doing this at home and you're watching a video, go ahead and pause that video here and give this one a try. I'd like you to find the expected value and variance if you have a Bernoulli trial where P is equal to 0 0.3. Let's see how you did. X values, probabilities, zero and one. Zero shows up 70% of the time because one shows up, my success rate is 30%. So this is my P, my success rate. This is Q, my failure rate. So expected value of X, I'm taking the first X value zero times its probability 0 0.7. Next X value is one, its probability is 0 0.3. If I type this into a calculator, I get 0 0.3 for that expected value. I'm doing a lot of these examples. And again, the reason for this is I'm really trying to understand 
what the average and expected value looks like for just one trial before I try to do this for n trials. Variance, I have zero minus the center squared times the probability of zero. I have one minus the center squared times the probability of one. When I type this into a calculator, I get 0 0.21. And on the last one, I noticed something kind of unique. 0 0.21, well, 21 is the same thing as seven times three. So I almost feel like there might be a shortcut for this. Let's see if this works going backwards. 0 0.6, 0 0.4, if I multiply that, I get 0.24. Okay, this looks like this is working. 0.25, five times five gives me 25. Yeah, that might be the case. Let's see if this holds up, but it looks like this could be my P times my Q for that variance there. Now, expected value, 0.3, that was my P. Expected value, 0.4, that was my P. It looks like my average is just going to be P. This is a very mathy thing to do, do a bunch of examples and then look for some sort of a pattern and then prove that pattern. So let's go ahead and do that. Let's prove for sure that this is actually P and this is P times Q. This is also good practice in really understanding that formula for random variables for finding the expected value and variance in general. So if I'm dealing with the Bernoulli trial, this is only for a Bernoulli trial, but it looks like the average is P and the variance is P times Q. So let's establish a proof. The most generic Bernoulli trial I can have is gonna have either zero or one successes. My probability of success will be the letter P and the probability of failure will be the letter Q. And I'm gonna use the formulas to find the expected value and variance while I still have it in sort of this letter format. So expected value, I'm taking the first X value in the table times its probability, the second X value times its probability. Zero times anything is zero, so I have zero. 1 times p is just p. I have 0 plus p. That's p. That's what I was hoping for. My expected value is just my success rate. Let's look at the variance. I'm taking the first value in the table minus the center, and I square it. And I multiply this by the probability of that zero, which is the letter Q. I'm taking the next value in the table. I subtract the center. I square it. And I multiply this by its probability, P. I'm going to use some algebra techniques here. I'm going to simplify things as much as I can. First off, zero minus P is negative P. But if I square that, that's going to make this positive. So I have P squared times Q. On this next part, this is P. I'm just going to leave that as a P. And if P plus Q is equal to 1, P and Q are complements. Just a little bit of scratch work on the side. This is the same thing as saying if I ever saw 1 minus P show up, that's Q. So in this part here where I have one minus P, this is really the same thing as Q squared. I'm noticing these both have a P and a Q that I can remove or factor out. Ooh, and that's kind of nice because I'm seeing that P times Q show up. So let's see what remains if I factor this out. This used to have two P's and one Q, and I've taken away one of the P's and one of the Q. So the only thing left for that first piece is a P. 
I've taken away the only P and one of the Q's, so I still have one Q left for that second piece. So if you multiply this out, P squared times Q, P times Q squared works out just fine. I see the P times Q that I want here, but I have this P plus Q piece, but those are complements. This is really just the number one. Multiplying by one doesn't change anything. I end up with P times Q how I was hoping. I've got my formula. Let's use the formula. So suppose X is a Bernoulli trial and P has a 20% success rate. Calculate the average and the variance. Okay. Since it's Bernoulli, my expected value, I just proved this, is just P. So my average is 0.2. I don't have to go through this long formula anymore. I now have a really nice chart that I can use. Let's look at the variance. This is now P times Q. I have a 20% success rate. So that must mean my failure rate, because they're opposites, 20% success, 80% failure. If I multiply these numbers together, two times eight, and I'm careful with the decimals, I get 0.16 for my variance. I now have a really, really good starting place that I can build on now to look at multiple trials. So if I'm looking at n trials instead of one, it's called a binomial random variable. Bi means two. So I have only two options. I either have a success for each trial or failure. I have a fixed probability of success, P, and a fixed probability of failure, Q. This is really the same thing that I had for Bernoulli. I just have multiple Bernoullis. Independence between trials. There's a backup or I've got the 10% rule. I need to have a fixed number of trials that I'm concerned about. And the letter I use for the fixed number of trials will be M. And finally, the last bit here, I need to not be concerned about where those successes and failures happen. So if I'm hoping that I have three people that are O positive blood type out of 100, I don't care if it's the first three or the last three, I just want three somewhere. If order does matter, You got two options. You can either use a tree or you can multiply out the events. So you can think of a binomial distribution as being a sum of a whole bunch of successes and failures. You either win or you lose the first game. You either win or lose the second game. And you'll add up the total number of wins for the season, just taking it one trial at a time. So a binomial, is really just the sum of n Bernoulli's. The notation I use for a binomial is b for binomial, n for the number of trials, and p for my probability of success. I'm going to jump a couple of pages here in this packet that I'm working on, and I'm going to try to use everything I know about Bernoulli's to see what I can figure out about binomials. So I'm skipping all the way to the last page here. So let's suppose we're taking a sample of 50 people. And of those, we anticipate 6% should have an O negative blood type. Taking an educated guess, what do you think the average should be? Well, I would expect the average should be 6% of 50. So if I'm wondering how many people should have this blood type, it should be that percentage out of the total. In math, I would do 0 0.06 
times 50 to figure out what that number is. Let's try that out. When I did this, I got an expected value of three. I expect three people to have this O negative blood type. Now, if I'm labeling these things with that notation, this 50, that's the number of trials, the 6%, that's my success rate. So it looks like to find the expected value for a binomial, I have N times my probability of success. And this is actually somewhat reasonable if you break it down because what's going on here is you had P plus P plus P plus P N times because each one of these Bernoulli's had an expected value of P. So if I'm trying to think about what the variance should be, well, for a single trial, it's P, Q, but now I have N of them. So my variance for a larger group is going to be N of these P, Qs. Let me show you what this looks like in practice and why this is extraordinarily useful. So let's figure out how many people we should expect to have O negative blood type and how that amount of variance. So the expected number or my average is going to be the number of people times the success rate. So I have 50 times 0 0.06. I expect three people. For the variance, this is my sigma squared. I'm taking number of trials, success rate times failure rate. So I have 50 times 0 0.06, 6% success rate. If 6% are O negative, then that tells me the rest of the population, 94%, are not. I'm going to type that into a calculator and I'm going to see what I get. And I'm not using long, messy formulas now to find averages and standard deviations. I'm just doing these quick things here to come up with these values. I get 2.8. Two. The expected value, I expect to have three people with O negative blood type. If I want to know what the standard deviation is like for that, I can just take the square root of this variance. And the square root of 2.82 gives me a standard deviation of 1.679 people or so. So here's why this is really, really useful. So suppose that there's some sort of an emergency and there are, a blood bank is in desperate need of O negative blood and they need eight bags of blood and they have 50 people coming in to donate that day. Let's try to figure out if this would be usual or unusual to get that many individuals. And if it's unusual, they might want to try to aim for a higher sample size than just 50. So I'm going to calculate the z-score. And to find the z-score, I'm going to take the value I care about, subtract the center, and I'll divide it by the standard deviation. The value I care about here is 8. The center or the expected amount is 3. And the standard deviation is 1.679. And I'm really hoping that this is within two standard deviations, because if it is, then that's considered usual. If it's more than two standard deviations away, I would be worried about this blood drive. When I type this into a calculator, I get 2.98 or so. It's more than two standard deviations away. And if it's more than two standard deviations away, this is an unusually high amount. So not a great situation 
but it's good to know about this ahead of time. And finding the average and standard deviation for binomials is a really fast formula. Now, it tells me it's unusual, but I still don't know how unusual. So eventually I want to be able to say something like there's a 3% chance or there's a 1% chance of getting that many people or more. I'd like to kind of build up to that a little bit. So we're going to flip back and we're going to continue on an earlier page, but I'm keeping this going on in the back of my head. I want to be able to determine how likely it is to get a z-score of like 2.98 or higher. So binomials, we're going to work to find the likelihoods of some of these events. This is my current goal. And binomial notation is B for binomial, N for the number of trials, and P for my fixed probability of success. So I wanna go through a couple of quick problems and see if they're binomial or not binomial. This first one, X is the number of times you flip a coin until you get heads. So this seems good at first glance. I've got success failure. I have a fixed probability of success, 50%, and a fixed probability of failure, also 50%. One coin flip does not affect another, so I have independence. In fact, I feel like I have everything I need for this to be a binomial with n trials and p as my success rate. But reading through this, there is no fixed n. It says flip until you get heads. Maybe that takes one flip. Maybe it takes 100. I don't want to deal with trees that go on forever without knowing where I'm supposed to end or start or what parts I'm using or anything confusing like that. I just want to have nice trees that stop all at exactly the same spot. So since this does not have a fixed n, this is not binomial. 30% of Jolly Ranchers are grape flavored. A bag has 200 candies and you grab two of them. Let X represent the number of great candies. Is X binomial? Well, I have success failure because it's either great or not great. I'm told the percentage of grape is 30. So that means the percentage of candies that are not grape are going to be 70. And I also have independence. Although if I grab a grape candy and I eat it, I feel like I actually changed the percentage. So I'm a little bit worried about that, but we are sampling less than 10% of the candy. So I have success failure, I have fixed probability, fixed uh, for success and failures, and I don't have independence, but I do have the backup so I can assume it. We are sampling less than 10% of the population. Here's how I know that. I have grabbed two candies out of 200. That is 1% that I'm sampling. Those are so few that if you had a jar with 200 candies, you would not notice if two were missing. So we are dealing with a binomial situation. I am looking at two candies at a time, and the percentage of those that are great is 30. Example 10, a particular family, there's a 50% chance that any given child has brown hair. The family has three children. Let X represent the number of children with brown hair, okay? Out of three children, a 50% success rate, either brown hair or not brown hair. I have fixed success and failures. I have one person does not affect another. I have a binomial. Now, using this binomial situation, I can try to figure out the probabilities of some of these events. 
I'm going to do a couple of them with you. And to try to figure out all of these things here, let's try to make a big tree. And the first child either has brown hair or does not have brown hair. Second child either has or does not have. Third child either has or does not have. I'm seeing a bit of an issue with these binomials is even though I have nice trees in the sense that my probabilities stay the same throughout, I have independence and I have a set number of branches, they still get really big even for a small sample size of three. If I had to do this for a sample size of 20, this tree would be unreasonable to draw. So I'm hoping there's a way that I can do some of this using technology so I don't have to keep drawing these things. And I'm gonna answer uh, just a handful of these things with you. I'm gonna do these four. Calculate the probability that none of them have brown hair. Well, let's just count the number of brown hairs for each of these. Uh, so starting from the beginning, one, two, three browns for that. Brown, brown, not brown, that's two. Brown, not brown, brown, that's two. Brown, not brown, not brown, that's one. No, yes, yes, that's two. No, yes, no, that's one. No, no, yes, also one. No, 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 that's zero. So to find the probability that none of them have brown hair, that's the probability that X is equal to zero. That's way down at the bottom. That's 0 0.5 times 0 0.5 times 0 0.5. That's 0 0.5 cubed. Typing that into a calculator, I get 0.125. Exactly one. So that shows up here, here, and here. And on each of those, I have 0.5 times 0.5 times 0.5, but it's showing up in three spots. Adding those together, I get a 37.5% shot. Exactly two, that shows up in one, two, three spots as well. So it looks like the probability that X equals two should also be 37.5. All brown hair, that's up at the top, that's x equals three. That only happens at this one spot, 0. 0.5 times 0. 0.5 times 0. 0.5. I think that's 0.125. Now, again, if I was dealing with even a slightly bigger sample size, say 10, this method starts to fall apart really quickly. As is, there's a lot for me to keep track of. So let's look at the next page and try to come up with strategies for when my trees get too big to use. So kicking it up a notch, suppose I have a true and false exam and it has 10 questions. If I'm drawing the tree, that's 10 sets of branches. That's way, way too big. So this is too big for a tree. So in this situation instead, I'm gonna use my calculator to find the probability. And the thing I'm using in my calculator whenever I want the probability that X is equal to a specific success amount, I'm gonna be using binomials for a particular value. This is a, pro a binomial probability density function and it looks at one value at a time. So if it has equals, you're using the PDF option. It's gonna ask you how many trials is it out of? In this case, it's out of 10 trials. It's gonna ask you the probability of success. And it's gonna ask you how many wins you want in that set. Let me show you how to do this using a calculator. 
So if you're on a TI-83 or an 84, I'm going into uh, second VARs. I'm trying to get into the spot where it says distribution. So second VARs. And I'm going to scroll down until I see the option for binomial PDF. It's going to ask you for the number of trials. This is out of 10 trials. If it's a true and false test, there's a 50% chance that you get any of these things right. And for the number that I want to get right, I want to get exactly six right on the test. Hitting enter. This gives me the probability of having exactly k successes. In this case, k is six of 0 0.205 or so. Let's see what this looks like on a TI-89 instead. Now, just a note, if you were on a TI-83, you might not have that pretty interface. It might just show you something that looks like this when you do binomial PDF. That's fine. Type in your N first, and then the comma button. The comma is above the 7. Then your probability, comma button above the 7 and the number of successes that you want. So it works the same way on the 83 and the 84. The 84 just looks a little bit prettier. TI-89. I'm going and I'm hitting the apps button. And then inside of my calculator, I'm going to choose the apps that says stat list editor. There we are, stat list editor. And I'm working with the distribution, so I'm going to go up top where it says F5 for distra. And I'm going to scroll down. I'm looking for something that says binomial. And I'm going to choose the option for binomial PDF. It'll ask me for the number of trials. It's 10. It'll ask me for the probability of success. It was 50% for this one. And it'll ask me for my x value that I care about, in this case, 6. When I do this and I hit enter, it gives me the probability of exactly six successes, 0 0.205 or 20.5%. I've showed you how to do this now on a TI-83, an 84, and an 89. I also want to show you how to do this in GeoGebra, just in case you don't have access to a graphing calculator at home. Although you can download TI Smart View TI-84 Plus from the Texas Instrument website and get a free trial of that thing if you just want a graphing calculator to try out for a couple months. But I downloaded GeoGebra Classic, totally free program, highly recommend. And I'm choosing the option for probability. So I'm going to share my screen with you so you can see what I'm doing. And I'm going to reopen this thing from scratch so you can see all of those steps. I'm going into GeoGebra Classic. I'm choosing the option for probability. And it starts with this smooth bell curve called the normal distribution. Uh, I don't know what that is. I'm not really worried about that right now. I'm going to go to the drop down menu. And I'm going to choose the option for binomial. It's going to ask me for the number of trials. It did, and now there we are. I'm looking at 10 trials. It'll ask me for my probability. I have 0.5. And on the side here, it actually gives me all of the probabilities that I could ever want. Uh, here, the probability of having exactly six successes is 0 0.2051, but I also have the probability of getting zero questions right, all the way up to getting all 10 right. Uh, you'll notice that the most likely event is probably that I get about half of them right if I'm guessing. It's not that likely that I miss them all, and it's not that likely that I get them all right either.
So I now have a couple different ways to do this thing using technology. Let's look at another question. And I'm leaving GeoGebra open because I'm going to use GeoGebra on the next couple here. It seems like the cleanest one. 30% of Jolly Ranchers are grape flavored. A bag has 200 candies. You grab two of the candies. What is the probability of getting exactly two grapes out of two poles? So I am dealing with n equals two for the number of trials. The percentage of these things that are grape are 30%. And I want exactly two things to be grape. So I'm going to type all of this thing inside of GeoGebra. Number of trials. Out of two. My probability of success. Out of 30. And I want two of them to be grape. I see two right there inside of my table. That's 0 0.09 or 9% or so. Family has three children, 50% chance of having brown hair. Oh, it's this problem again. Great. So three children, 50% chance. I have n equals three trials. My probability of success is 50%. And I want to know what's the probability that none of them have brown hair. So this will be k equals 0. Exactly 1 has brown hair, k equals 1. Exactly 2 has brown hair, k equals 2. And all of them, k equals 3. Let's see what this gives us for our probability distribution. I have n is 3. And my probability of success is 50%. And I have zero, uh, 50. There we go. And I have 0, 1, 2, and 3 right here on the side. I've got all of my probabilities. So the probability of having no children with brown hair, 12.5%. The probability of having one child with brown hair, 37.5. Two with brown hair, 37.5. All of them have brown hair, 12.5%. When we did the big tree, I got 12 and a half, 37 and a half, 37 and a half, and 12 and a half. I'm still getting the same percentages, but using technology, I no longer have to draw these big trees out. This is saving me a considerable amount of time. I can even use GeoGebra to answer more complicated questions like, what is the probability of having two or less children have brown hair? So let's figure out that probability here using GeoGebra. I want two or less. So I'm looking at two or less. Do you see how I can just click on the bottom where these arrows are? And I can highlight the values that I want to include. GeoGebra will automatically add them for me on the bottom and tell me that the probability of two or less successes is 0 0.875. So now I can really ask any sort of success rate question involving probabilities and successes and failures. Let's do another page of practicing this stuff. So a student guesses on every question on a true false test. Let x represent the number that they get right. What is the probability that they get eight or less right? What's the probability that they get six or less right? What's the probability that they get seven or more correct? So let me do each of these using GeoGebra.
And inside of GeoGebra, for the number of trials, I'm looking at 10. For a success rate, if I'm guessing on each of them, 50%. So I'm going to go back into my GeoGebra. For the number of trials, I'm looking at 10. 50% success rate. Great, here I am. I want eight or less for this first one. So I'm going to drag this first block here, and I'm going to put the arrow on the eight. I want eight or less, so I'm going to drag the other one down and until I shade everything less than eight. And it'll add it up for me, and it'll drop it in this gray box here. The probability of having eight or less successes using GeoGebra was 98.93%. So if I wanted to know, well, what's the probability that I get a B or lower if I guess on a true false exam? Well, there's a 90, almost 99% chance that you get a B or lower. It's really unlikely that you guessed your way into an A. Let's look at the probability that you get six or less correct. That's pretty easy. I'm just gonna move that block that was at an eight to six. I'm now adding six and less. In GeoGebra, that gave me a probability of 82.81%. I want seven or more, fine. I'll move that up all the way to the top. I'll move this one to seven, and I get 0 0.1719. You can also do this stuff in a graphing calculator. So let me show you what it looks like to do all of this in a graphing calculator. If you're doing equals and you're using technology, this is going to be your PDF option. If you have some sort of an inequality, less than or equal, some number, this is the option for binomial CDF in your calculator. So for example, if I wanted to do the probability of eight or less, I'm going to tell you the setup and then I'm going to show you where it is. I'm using binomials, so binom. I'm looking at eight or less, that's the CDF option. Out of 10 questions, 50% chance that I get any one of those questions correct. And I want eight or less. So it looks identical to my PDF setup. The only difference is I'm using C whenever I want that amount or less. I'm going to start with my TI 8483. Second VARS. PDF for equal, CDF for less than or equal. I have my number of trials. I have my probability. And I have the amount that I want. I want eight or less. If I'm on a TI-83, I choose binomial CDF, 10, comma, 0 0.5, comma, 8. When I do this, I get exactly the same thing that I got in GeoGebra. I get 0 0.9893. If I wanted to do six or less in my calculator, Binome CDF out of 10, 50% success rate, and I want six or less. So I'm going to do that last thing, the binome CDF again, and I'll just change that eight to a six. So just like GeoGebra, this is giving me 82. 0.81% as the likelihood of six questions or less correct on a true false test with 10 questions. Now, just a note, my calculator only knows how to do this amount and less. If you run into a situation where it actually wants you to have some amount or more, this will be the complement of some amount or less. Let me show you what I mean. And I'm gonna show you in GeoGebra, and I'm also gonna show you what it looks like for the calculations I have here. 
So inside of GeoGebra, if I want seven or more, do you see how the thing that's not shaded in, this white part of my graph, this is everything from six or less. So if I want seven or more, then the thing I do not want is six or less. So if I want seven or more, I'm gonna do one minus six or less. I already know that answer for six or less. That's that 82.81 that I just found. And if I do the subtraction, I get 0 0.1719, which is exactly the same thing as GeoGebra. My results are matching up just fine. TI-89 folk, let me show you how to do it there. And I will give my screen a second to catch up to my TI-89 and adjust with the uh, dim a little bit. Okay, I'm going into distribution still, so I'm choosing F5. I want binomials, so I'm checking to see for binomial CDF. On the TI-89, it asks for the number of trials, it asks for the probability of success, and it also asks for both a low value and a high value. So if I wanted from eight and down, the lowest value I would be shading in is zero, and the highest value I would be shading in is eight. When I do this and hit enter, I'm getting this 98.93 number showing up again. Things are matching up for eight or less. Let's look at six or less. This is gonna be everything from zero to six. So in my calculator, F5 for distributions. I'm choosing the option for binomial CDF. I'm shading from zero to six. And just as before, this is giving me 82.81%. Unlike the TI-84, if I wanna find the probability of seven or more, I can just select the option CDF, low value from seven, and I wanna shade this thing in all the way up to 10. I'm gonna hit enter and enter again. This is giving me that 17.19% that I had from earlier. I now have three options. I can use a TI-89, an 8384, they work the same way, or I can use GeoGebra. Let's look at one more of these, and then I'm gonna leave you a few for you to kind of practice if that's something that you'd like to do. Suppose that there are 20 donors coming in to donate blood. I'm going back to that example. And it is known that 6% uh, are these universal donors with this O negative blood type. What's the probability that exactly two have O negative blood? So if I'm setting this thing up, exactly two is going to be equals to, if I'm using my calculator, this is going to be a binomial PDF option because it's equal. Out of 20 people, 6% success rate, and I want the value 2. So I'm going to go into GeoGebra. It's out of 20. And my success is 0, 06. And I want exactly two. I see that number right there for two. I've got 0.2246. Nice and easy. I get the results that I need. So this should hopefully give you a starting point for how to look at binomial probabilities. The best way to really master something is to practice it though. So I encourage you to work through as many problems as possible involving the binomial distribution. I hope you have a great day.